I think we can get started. Um, it looks like we've had 1 pull request. That would be by me, Duncan, so I can speak to it if people would like. Um, it's a really simple one. Um, it, there's actually 2 parts to it really. What 1 part is, so I want to make a new use case and I actually want to make a bunch of new UK use cases and I realized that. How we have our um, repo structured, we have a, a subdirectory called docs, and we sort of just have everything jumbled in it. And it's already got one subdirectory in it that I put in some VEX related use cases. There are some use cases sort of at the highest level of the directory. Um, and I wanted to put another one, and I realized, well, geez, and if I put in this and a few more in, it's going to get really like messy. Um, so the first part of the of the pull request basically just makes a new subdirectory called use cases. Um, and then the second part makes a very simple use case that it sticks in the directory. Assuming everybody agrees with the concept that we could should put the use cases all in a subdirectory to keep sort of the higher level cleaner, um, then I would in subsequent pull requests move some of the existing stuff um, down into that subdirectory. But the um so so one question to the group will be sort of, hey, do you agree with we should stick them all in a subdirectory? And then the second, which was the original impetus of the PR, was there is a particular extremely high level pace use case that makes up a fictitious big enterprise that basically says, hey, I want to know my overall enterprise security posture. Hey, pace, go put together a bunch of your information and just tell me and bucket the state of my enterprise into one of four states, which are um, uh, I'd have to actually look at it to remember what they were. I, I didn't call it quiescent. I called it something like that. But bas basically, situation normal, you're under threat, you're under an attack, but it's not a massive attack or you're under a massive attack, basically. And, and it wasn't to standardize on those categories. It was to show the concept of PACE can implement your security policies and tell you what state you're in. And it's a really high level one because I wanted to basically use what state you're in and some of my other use cases that I sort of have it, have it exist to do that. Um, so it's probably easiest to actually see the, um, the pull request. If you go ahead and click on the sparrows where you just were on the pull request, or maybe you already did it. Yeah, click on the sparrow slash CAW, which will bring you over to here, then click on docs. And you'll see now there's a directory called use cases that wasn't there in the main. You click on that, it's got a readme. And then you click on the one particular enterprise security posture. That's the new uh, use case. If you scroll down, there's the picture of the four states, basically. Um, so that's my proposed addition to the use cases. So again, two parts. Everyone sort of agree we should stick them all in a subdirectory. And then second, anybody disagree with this particular use case? I looked this over this morning and it all looks reasonable to me. So hearing no dissension, okay to go ahead and have Sarah uh, merge the PR in. All righty, thank you. So I should still be putting this in progress or because this is kind of minor, um, or should I just close this out? Yeah, I would actually say go ahead to done it. You know, look okay. from your choices on the list there, done would be the right one. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, I think these are older pull requests. Um, I think from last week, let me see, let me close this up for a second. Um, we'll go to um, just issues We're on. Um, from what I remember is we didn't, uh, we might have wanted to revisit some of these issues because not everybody had been on the call previously. Yeah. 
Well, and some of them we actually reached agreement on. It's just we sort of left hanging and they're open until somebody actually writes some text to put somewhere. Yeah, that's that's definitely true for some of these. Like I think um, some of these bottom two. Were there any that you missed, Duncan, that you want to cover? Nope, that was, uh, I need to get back to some of that, but I haven't lately. How about for anybody else? Is it more helpful for me to pull up the project instead? We have in progress. I remember correctly, some of the in progress we actually have made decisions on, we just haven't actually succeeded in capturing those decisions somewhere. Um, do you happen to know which ones? Not off the top of my head. I guess I'll just work my way backwards. Let's see. I just added the to do. Multiple implementations. This one, I think, again, has the comments. Yeah, we should not pick a winner. Yeah, I think the only ones where we added comments is not pick a winner in multiple implementations for these two. Well, we may have to just start at the bottom and decide whether some of them can be closed or they actually require more discussion. I sort of treat issues as a discussion forum, but I don't see a whole lot of discussion going in there. So we, we either need to have the discussion at the meetings and dispose of the issues or have discussions in the issues themselves, however, however we want to work. Well, and it's a, I think you're right, Dave, this is not going to, but it's sort of a two part. One, one is you create the issue to, so that we'll have the discussion. And if we're not ready to have the discussion or something else higher priority, then we just leave it an issue till we get to it. Um, and if no one gets to it, then obviously it's not an important enough issue. It doesn't mean it would necessarily go away. It's just, all right, we leave it there till somebody cares or we close it because we say, nope, that's just not an issue. But the bigger, I hate to reuse the word issue, but I'll say issue, the bigger issue is for those that we do discuss, we need to figure out how to resolve them. So we, we like some of these we have resolved, but they're not resolved to be able to be closed because we have to put our resolution somewhere. It can't just be in the text of the issue. Hey, we talked about it on this meeting. We agree that whatever there can be more than one reference implementation or not. I don't even remember the answer to that one, but, um, but we then need to, well, particularly the scope ones. Remember our, fo our Adam had asked our sort of focus in the near term be on, Hey, let's at least get our scope about right. We did resolve a bunch of scope issues. Some things in some things out. We just need to like write a scope document or put them in somewhere put put we so that we can actually say yeah we've decided that for now this is out of scope and this is in scope and this is never going to be in scope or whatever it is we decide but we need actual text um 
and that's where we all sort of agree on stuff, but no one volunteers to do the text. And I'll admit I've been busy enough. Plus, I've had some health issues that I'm way behind on everything. So uh, I have not gotten any of that. And I'm not even volunteering for a lot of it. But I will volunteer for some of it. So if we sort of don't have anything, then, I mean, we could use the meeting as a working meeting to try and make some of that text or... I would say in the future, at least when we think we're resolving an issue, we should like at that instant, go ahead and all right, what text do we put somewhere and go put it somewhere so we can actually close something. Is there a... Oh, go ahead. So with regard to where to put the resolutions, because once we, once we close an issue, it disappears and unless someone goes poking and looks for closed, they're never going to see it. So I definitely agree we needed issue resolution captured someplace more visible um on the one hand you know github gives us wiki capabilities all of their kind of weak and that might arguably be a place to put it but i don't think people go look at the wikis very often by instinct so it seems like some kind of issue resolution document up at the in the root folder is probably ultimately the most effective way to capture what the issues were, what the resolution was, and you could create a pointer to the, you know, link to the closed issue so that background discussion to whatever degree it was captured there is readily accessible. I propose an alternative. Mm -hmm. I think rather than having a catch all issue document, at least to begin with, I believe the vast majority of our work has been associated with scope. So I think we could, I think we should have a scope document. And the problem is that sounds very daunting and big or whatever, but it could start literally with an empty document. And then the first step in it could, the first thing in it could be, I don't know, is asset inventory within pay scope? I think we decided it wasn't. Literally can have one sentence in it that, you know, we put a PR that says, um, we've decided that for now, asset inventory is handled by other systems and outside the scope of the pay system. We argue about that sentence for a while. We agree to it. Um, once we agree to it, and the pull request is accepted. We close this that issue. Then we go on to whatever the next issue is on there. And and, he, and it's not say really a scope document. It really is sort of a list of the issues resolved. But that's sort of good enough for now. That makes sense. And then if some other issue isn't related to the scope document, then we figure out where it belongs and put it where it belongs. And if need be, we make a catch all for issues, but I'd, I'd rather have the scope stuff all in one place in a place called scope. Yeah, that, that sounds like a dedicated scope document sounds fine to me. Um, I raised issue 20 because I don't think that particular issue is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it needs more discussion if we're actually going to try to implement PACE in a call. And the cause coming up in eight weeks. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, whether we say, yeah, it's inside or outside of Pace's scope, we're still going to have to deal with it somehow and make a decision on how to deal with it. If we want to do anything at the call with Pace. So refresh my memory, because it's all tiny on my screen, which one's 20? Um, that was my that's up at the top that was my architecture flows the idea that the decision maker is outside of pace and the pcs and par are inside of pace but both the decision maker and the pcs need to know about assets and so whether you put asset management inside or outside it has to get it has to cross a boundary to get to one or the other. So can we spend a few minutes discussing that? Would that be an okay agenda topic? Sure. Um, you can click on that bottom diagram there, OC2 get us bomb. And you know, my idea was, and you know, it's just a proposal that the decision maker needs to know what components to ask about before it can say, give me the S bomb for this component. And so if, pay, if asset management is outside, 
then the decision maker just talks to asset management to figure out what the components are, but then the PCS doesn't know. So does it know what? Do, it knows yeah. what it has. Well, decision maker sends a open C2 command. Number one says, give me the S bomb for component X. Now, posture at PCS, how does it do number three at number two? How does it send a command to component X when it has no idea what the components are? But it just got told it. Let, let's do, so let's talk call for a second. So let's talk, hey, we're only talking June, so we're talking eight weeks away. We're not talking ServiceNow interfaces and SaaS interfaces. Um, you know, there are huge, you know, you know, government has a gazillion inventory system. Yeah. AT T has huge inventory. IBM has huge inventory systems. I personally think Pace should not take over those inventory systems and reinvent them. They they already exist. Absolutely. Um, so my my personal opinion is that for at least the very near term walk and crawl states, certainly the crawl state, we do. I'm going to say hard coded cases of, yeah, the PCS knows that Duncan has four, you know, different types of blinky boxes and you like literally craft the open C2 command like you would craft it, you know, all said and done in open C2, you have either a, um, a sort of one-to-one -one relationship with HTTP or a bus relationship with MQTT or open DXL or whatever you want to use. Um, and you, either are explicitly talking to a particular thing when you send its command, or you're um, going to a class of things that are somehow described in a pub sub architecture, and that's who sees your command. And then you ask for something specific. So in our simple June case, in both those cases, don't we have enough information to do that, that we don't need asset management systems? Well, okay, yeah, we, we've got the crawl management system, but where is it? Say we've got a spreadsheet or a JSON file that says component X, component Y, component Z. Now, what do they, I guess you could say you have to pre-configure the components to subscribe to a topic. If we're using, yeah, I'm assuming we're going to use the pub sub bus for June. So yes. Okay. So yeah, if, if yeah, I, I'm not saying design something or replace enterprise. I'm saying for the simplest way to get a component online so that it can be used, what is the information that the decision maker needs to know about that component? Yeah, and I guess I'd word it slightly different that for our crawling stage, we assume all our asset management systems are, I'm going to use the term hard coded, and that the decision maker just knows Duncan has three blinky boxes. The posture collection service knows it. However, we chose to tell it, it, it it's, I'm going to say using the hand waving aspect of everything. Okay. Um, so, the, but the so idea is us, we literally, you know, say, yeah, yeah, Dave and Duncan and Dave, let's agree to this you know, pub subgroup or whatever, and we put them in it. <clears throat> okay, so that means, yes, if we hard code it into both the decision maker and the PCS, and then somebody brings another Blinky in, and then we make a change, make a hard coded change to both of those. I mean, that'll, that'll work also. I'm, and, I'm and just- that's my, that's my crawl version. My, my walk version is, some system outside of PACE manages all that and tells each of the decision maker, PCS, PES, whoever else needs to know who the choices are. And I think once we look at the actual commands, you'll see that you actually don't need to know them a priori. I don't think, I, th I think the decision maker will have to know all this stuff. I agree. Um, but the, everything else just goes by, Hey, either, you know, either ask me something I have, and if I have it, I tell you, and if I don't have it, I don't tell you, I don't, I don't need to inventory it, so to speak. Okay. Well, my idea was that it would get hard coded into the par and then use the par interface to find it out. But 
Oh. See, see the, the problem with the problem I have with with it coming inside the interface is, is twofold. One is, you know, all said and done, we're a new fledging project, and I don't want to take on 800 pound gorillas that are going to squash us. And if we go about saying, hey, yeah, we're going to standardize, you know, asset inventory for the world now, believe me, we'll get squashed. Okay, the the SaaS and SaaS and ServiceNow, and I forget all the other big vendors, but they're, I mean, like SaaS is the largest software company in the world. ServiceNow is probably growing to be almost it. Um, they're not going to take to us telling them how to do their business. And they already work and they're already fine. And yeah, they don't have a standardized interface, but that's not our problem. Um, our problem is what information do we need inside PACE and can we get it from outside PACE? So it's a question of, is it sort of inside the dotted line or outside the dotted line? If we make it outside the dotted line. We just got to define the green, red, and blues to get what we need. But I think PAR is going to have to keep track of the metadata that's, I don't know what the right word is. I'm going to call it common across lots of elements. And yeah, it's sort of got to know the elements, but it doesn't have to know the elements if that makes any sense you, you i need to know that version you know log 4j whatever is vulnerable with cve whatever then i need to know that log 4j is in the following software components and that's sort of inside par and then i need to know somewhere that i have you know i don't know cisco router or whatever has this software component we were just talking about what I don't think I need to know inside PACE, at least initially, certainly not before running, certainly not at walk crawling or walking. I don't need to know that I have 10,000 instances of it and that three of them are in San Francisco and six of them are in Melbourne and four of them are, you know, whatever, and they're connected to these other things and all this other, I'll call it ancillary information that's already in ServiceNow or SaaS or whatever, you know, inventory system you use. Um, so the instantiation stuff is in the normal inventory place and the what it means is inside pace and the two combined get combined. You know, decision maker asks, hey, you know, log uh, Cisco version 7.6. Do I need to worry about it? Pace, pace returns. Yeah, you do because it's got log 4J in it and that makes this sort of vulnerability. And it comes back with, oh, wait a second, but it matters about 16 other controls are out of integrations and, th and that's all PES kind of stuff you'll need to do. But it doesn't need to know that three are in Melbourne and two are here. It needs to know the metadata about it. Right. Okay, well, we it, that will probably have to be documented somewhere. Yeah, you know, I'm I've been playing with Amazon um, and the MQTT interface. And obviously in order for a component to talk MQTT, it has to have a device ID and it has to have an agent, you know, it has to have the agent software installed on the device. Um, in addition, in order to work with Amazon, you have to give it a credential. So when you enroll an IOT device, it actually generates a certificate for you. And so in it, you download the agent to the device and that includes its credential. So that's the minimum piece of asset management, the crawl piece that we need to figure out, but you can't, there's some step that you have to take in order to introduce component X to the integration bus. I, that I agree. And, and, as usual, the, the getting it on and all of a sudden done life, life ending it at some point also are usually the harder use cases, the easier crawl use cases. Yeah, we've waved our hands and we've, you know, we've got the stuff to start with. So at least for June, I would think we'd want to focus on, you know, we do what we got to do manually to get the stuff into the state. We need to have the stuff talk to each other, but to your bigger use case, there's sort of. I'll say three variants to what you said that we should probably make sure we, again, I don't know if we can handle in June, but it's possible we should. One is where, where everything you see on the page is all in one like system. So, you know, it's, it's Amazon one side, Amazon on the other side. Um, another choice is, well, it's Amazon on one side, but Azure on the other side, which is fancier, but should still work the same. But the sort of one that we'll 
probably forget usually, particularly coming from a very open C2 centric world, um, but is probably the majority case to begin with that I think we should try to handle if we can, is the case where the S bomb, there's not a component X with an S bomb AP. There's a, I don't know, component Y right next door in the picture. Okay. And it's not on the integration bus and it doesn't have its own S bomb. But the decision maker can still ask PACE to evaluate its security posture because it's, you know, it, it has an S bomb. The S bomb just isn't, you don't get the S bomb into the PAR by asking the component. You get the S bomb into the PAR because it was on some website somewhere or the vendor gave it to you or you're just a really smart par and you already had it. But but that the, the collection part isn't the issue. The evaluation part is um, you're, you got it somewhere else and you evaluate it the same way you evaluated the one you got from the component. Right. Yeah. And I, I think in the, the walk and run stage, that's probably the most common one already. You're, you're probably right. not going to have S bombs on, on devices, but yeah. So for June, it would be nice if we could, at least in some of the use cases have that, yeah, I don't care how I got it in the power. I got it in there. I did, I did my hand waving to get it in there. Um, but now that it's in there, I can still get it out of there. I can, I can still use it. Yeah. Okay. So two and three in the red interface doesn't exist for the crawl. In that case, you're, yep. you're just pre-populating the par. Right. With the components and their S bombs. Okay. I, I can, I can go with that too. That's, all righty. Well, that, that was a good discussion. Well, Duncan. Yep. Just backtracking a second. From our perspective with OpenC2, we have the OIF, the OpenC2 integration framework, that we have what you would call asset management integrated into it. Okay. At the moment, we're looking at adding um, intermediate options onto it, essentially turning it into a PCS. Okay. So then, how the PCS we would have would have asset management built in. However, the decision making would just know enough to ask questions. At the moment, we don't have shared assets yet. Yeah, and I'd, I'd even be careful on you saying you have asset management built in. So it, asset management is a- From the perspective a, of OpenC2, knowing how to talk to it, right. we do. Yeah, you, you, have, you have information about assets. You don't right. have asset management. <clears throat> and that's my view of what's inside of PACE, is sort of what it needs to know not that you're doing the asset management function for the corporation. Exactly. We have enough info to know enough to talk to it. Right. And and that's what I call for lack of a term hard coded. In a in a production system for the DOD, I don't suspect I could be wrong. I don't suspect you're going to, intending to take over the entire asset management of all DOD assets um, and stick it into that thing. What you're doing is you're saying, hey, for what we need to do to do the PACE function, you need to give us at least this much information and we'll keep track of that stuff. You'll keep track of, you know, how many whatevers you have and where they are and how much got paid for them and under which contract and which DFARs apply and all that other stuff that goes in asset management that the that the SASs and the service nows the world do. But we'll do the, hey, given we know you're talking about Blinky Maha sitting you know, on my desk here and I happen to know its name and its IP address, I need to know its name and IP address, otherwise I can't talk to it. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with, there's a certain amount of knowledge inside PACE about the assets. I'm disagreeing with that PACE is doing the asset management function. Right, so that's a right. problem with terminology then, because we, we I never thought 
that PACE would do enterprise asset management. I'm talking about collecting that information needed to allow the communication to happen. And we probably ought to just call that a different word then, but. Right. Yeah, because that's a, that's a, asset management is a defined term, well-known art in the industry. Yeah. And the other thing is I'll even second order push back on, I think it's too soon to tell it certainly for June for trials, we need to have some, I'll call it hard coded asset information. In the long run, does the PACE system itself ever have that information? Or is it, again, just an API that PACE needs to go talk to some other system to get when it needs to know it? Because um, even the association of um, you know, Cisco, version 3.2, you know, Cisco picks version 3.2, which I care about because it happens to have log4j in it. I'm making this up, obviously. Don't hold me to the Cisco really has that problem. Um, I probably use Cisco, use Acme. Acme um, picks system has um, uh, version 3.2. Pace knows that that software bill of materials has in it log4j of the version that's vulnerable, okay? And associated with a bunch of other information, it can make posture assessment information. Whether PACE itself needs to know any given device, any even the component X shown on this picture, whether PACE ever needs to inside it, inside its PAR, have the word component X anywhere in it, or it just always passes on the green, red, and blue lines, I think is open to future study there i think there's pros and cons to both it, it really mushrooms your data when you start keeping track of things that you have literally tens and hundreds of thousands of so if we could keep it to just i'll call it the metadata a state not the instantiation state i think we could make our interfaces much cleaner but again too soon to tell you guys are sort of coming at it from the now we'll just keep track of everything inside viewpoint um, I'm going to at least try to come at it from the, hey, can I do this in a way that I need to know what I need to know when I need to know it, but I don't need to know it any other time than that. Try and make the, because because all said and done, if you have to keep track of that stuff inside PAR, then you have to keep track of when it changes. And that means even though it's sort of nothing to do with pace per se, we need to keep track of all the, you know, the incremental stuff of interest to security. And it would be nicer if we could just keep track of the, what it means to security, not the, what it is. And I don't know that we'll be able to do what I want to do. I'm just hopeful, that's all. Okay, well, I'll use the word asset list for the for the piece of hard-coded stuff that we need. Um, but I'm, I think if we're getting rid of everything, including the specific assets that go on the asset list will wind up not demonstrating anything. So we, we're gonna have to think about these these flows. I, I agree it has to be somewhere. It's just whether it's inside the dotted line or outside the dotted line. Yeah, well, I, I don't, okay, that, that's fine. But if we say we're not going to talk to any components, we're just going to have an well, asset list to, that says okay, this component, Let's talk this example. Does in this example, does PACE a priori need to have component X in it? So when you wrote up the use case, you the first word I think was put an S bomb, get an S bomb from the component. Right, which the decision maker knew to say. So, okay, so the decision maker has the asset list hard coded in it. Now, the PCS, you were talking about green number one here. Right, so green number one says, hey, Pace, go get Blinky Maha. Here's how you talk to Blinky Maha information. Go get its S bomb. Okay, so in the OpenC2 command, you're putting all of its, you're not just, giving it the name component X, you're giving it its subscriber information or its IP address and everything it needs to connect. 
That that would be one way to do it. I don't know if that's the right way, but that's my point. Right, right. Okay. Well, we'll have to draw some flows to see how each of them will work. Yeah, now now for for June, it's certainly easier to sort of not make that part of the green line and just, you know, we know that Blinky Maha is at whatever address it's at or however we're gonna to talk to it. Um but it, it sort of gets to the, um, we, we, and we maybe need to do it both ways. We maybe need to try, you know, sort of run the code both ways and see what makes sense and which scales better. I am worried about the scale, particularly in IoT land, if we, if we need to keep track in the database of every instance of something and it's coming and going. Oh, Amazon's already proved that because they're doing security. You, you have to have a list of every credential that you've, issued to every IOT that can connect. So you only need to, you only need it. Well, again, that's a particular implementation by a particular, you know, company. Um, and you need it to talk to it. You don't need, again, if the decision make, if the asset inventory system kept that information and the decision maker got it from the asset inventory system, then it could provide it to you on the green line. Number one, not you have to keep it all the time. And again, I don't, I don't think it's an obvious answer either way. In fact, we might end up having to do it. You know, some people do it one way, some people do it the other way. We have to account for both. Yeah. Okay. Probably. So, end up on, I guess. so I guess the pace group and the call group aren't the same thing, but at least for the call group, we're going to have to pick some crawl interactions. Right. The, the call group working on implementing pace use cases on crawling pace use cases obviously has overlapped with the pace group. <laughs> okay, well, I'll shut up. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. This is good discussion. And I did, I did throw in the chat to everybody if they could fill out the survey and to Jason's point, no, unfortunately the survey, I'd have to redo the survey, which I'd prefer not to do. So just throw it in the comment and don't answer the question or whatever. Um, and Jason, can you say okay. what, what was the question you want to add the option to? Uh, oh, this is, oh, this is not, I'm not holding anybody to anything. If, if you would like to, then just answer yes. I'm not going to hold anybody to anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no worries. Yeah, I'll just. For uh, planning purposes. We need to know roughly how many people are going to show up, how many people are going to be on virtually, and how many people, you know, could care less. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure where it was. So if it's just emailing it to you or something, I'll just, I'll do it. Yep. Okay. We're trying to figure out what we're doing, Duncan, more or less, trying to figure out what we can do. So you're in the same we'll state as it. everyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I apologize. I am way behind on that stuff. Losing a couple of weeks due to medical stuff has not uh, helped me. So. And I'm not technically back at all yet either. So well, we'll see how my doctor's appointments go this week. I have a quick question since we're in a quiet point here. Sure. Um, so the the project. So this is a probably a really stupid question, right? So no stupid questions. Where where is so? I was poking around in the repo the other day. And it, is there, I don't want to say this the wrong way. Is there any code? <laughs> I thought, I thought that, um, there was code under development. Okay. Okay. It's all in other places. It's all in other repos. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. So is there, where are those? Is there somewhere we can go or is it internal still? Well, we're again this this whole vicious cycle of crawl walk run we're still not to crawl yet of so um i think it was jerry mentioned oif so the the um dod contract with hii has built some existing open source software for other projects that is being repurposed to meet these needs um and that's often their repos 
Um, I opened a bunch of repos that are still, you know, from the public version empty. My, I haven't committed to the public side yet. Um, that are some basically toys that I'm making to do some of this stuff. Um, we're, we're not there yet. And the question that's one of the questions on the scoping question. So this is a good, good lead into one of the scoping questions is, Hey, so let's say. Dave have as a reference implement. Dave Kemp has a reference implementation that does some of this stuff using, you know, AWS kind of API stuff. And Duncan has a different reference implementation that's written in Elixir and uses a bunch of his way of doing stuff. That the interfaces look the same, but the actual code is different. And uh, Dave Lemire and Crowd and HII have yet a, have the OIF and Yuki. They have two different implementations even that do the same thing, of of different piece parts of this. So let's say come. July, we have the beginning pieces of four different software repos that all sort of do some of this stuff. Is that okay? Is it okay to have more than one reference implementation or do we have to pick a winner? Um, and that's a that's a scope question we haven't answered yet. We decided to sort of go on the, hey, let's, let's get some working code first and we'll argue that stuff. So we did have previous Cause, and I know that we were using uh, Google as the MQTT broker for for messages, and yep. Duncan and Jerry both brought devices that talked MQTT over HII's Google MQTT broker, and so yep. there's, there is the software that they had to load onto both ends in order to make that work, and I, that was just. I think that was downloaded from the whoever the owner of MQTT is. It was just their their code. Yeah. So that's a starting point. But yes, Jason, we don't have have our own software, and I don't even know if the implementations from the previous hackathon still exist. They well, do, but I think the MQTT broker is still running, isn't it, Dave? Lemire. Yes, both of our brokers are still up in GCP running, MQTT being one of them. Yeah, and as you were talking about two different implementations of the same protocol, you know, Google's IoT is MQTT based. It's just that they require security. So it's and interesting to see if one client can connect to both, either with or without security and then another sort of very pace oca specific is that integration bus in the middle again because we sort of already have it working we've been talking mqtt for june but open dxl has been a i'll say dream <laughs> for a while to be the integration bus um and particularly if we want to talk back to you know make the use cases bigger and have you know stick shifter and kestrel as part of the bigger use cases um I'm guessing they talk talk open DSL, not MQTT. So we probably should again, probably that's walking or running, not crawling, but we probably should be looking at multiple integration bus choices too, besides the Google, I'm sorry, the Amazon way of doing it and the standard MQTT way of doing it. There's the open DX or I'll call it the McAfee way of doing it too. So well, yeah, and I mean and so, and and we don't stick Shifter and Kestrel. Neither of those have any open DXL hooks right now. Um, okay, I didn't realize that. I thought... No, I do know that CIS has built a bunch of stuff around open DXL, um, and I wasn't sure if some of that was going to be leveraged in this project or not. Um, there's also the Threat Bus, which uh, ten that the open source bus the Tenzier has, that's kicking around now as well. Um, and there's, you know, Mark's always talking about Kafka. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I, I'm i very much not wedded to any kind of a messaging technology. That's at this point, um, I, I don't think the OCA is like, behind anything specifically. That's that's actually why we renamed the ontology project. Good. Not Good. Yeah, because I like I like the way, I mean obviously I'm prejudiced, but I like the way OpenC2 did it of 
hey, we have these different transport mechanisms. We don't care which one you use. And right now, OpenC2 just has the two, HTTP and, and um, MQTT. But if we need some more, particularly to work with particular devices here, then yeah, we should we can just add I mean, them. I sort of like the bus independent way of, hey, that's just a different layer. Use whichever one you want. It could be interesting to see if some of this stuff you know, could some of these flows be modeled with OpenC2 commands and then then your fabric abstraction turns into that? Well, I will have to say the, that's already the have a mechanism they, they that. used, that's all we're doing is we're doing this all in OpenC2, so. Well, well, that's good then, right? Because that means that the actual messaging bus then, that's an OpenC2 thing. And there's already oh, a no, it's, it's, those, it's, it's right? a layer above open c2 it's a layer above the integration bus so the the green red and blue on the picture you're seeing right now are open c2 commands and and for june dave dave and duncan are working on various boxes that are hopefully going to talk to each other that are going to use mqtt as that middle arrow that's running horizontally through the middle um we could but, potentially yeah. also use http and we could potentially all also use open dxl we could potentially also use six other things those are all potentials we don't actually have the code for it and qtt we actually have the working code for now so yeah i i guess what i'm saying is and i might be off base here um so in open c2 you have a bunch of these different transfer specifications right yep. um so so wouldn't it just be pick one of those well, it is, and my point, my point is, if we have to pick one other than the two we have right now, um, we need to know what they are. So if OpenDXL really is something I need to do to make it work in OCA to talk to the other components, then I need an OpenDXL one, which I don't have, but we will work on more if we really need it. Um, but if I don't need it, I don't know that we'll spend a lot of time on it. Um, but if we need something else, you mentioned some other buses, then again, I didn't even know they existed. So. Um, I just need a transport fabric. Right now, the transport fabric I have that makes sense for June is MQTT, and it makes sense for what Dave, Dave, and Duncan, and Jerry, and the others on the call can talk. But if I want to hook in, because I really do want to hook in Kestrel and um, Stick Shifter and six other things, um, I don't know if MQTT is the right bus or not to use. Okay. Okay, so this clears it up. Yeah, the two transfer specs we have right now are point to point over HTTP and then pub sub using MQTT. So there was just one for each technique. And we have a draft open DXL transport spec that literally consists of the five words I just said draft open DXL transfer spec. <laughs> that's, that's the extent we have it. Um, we never went, well, I can't say we never went further than that. Dave Lemire and others have actually went further with it. We, we don't know if we need to go further with it. Uh, yeah, so like, yeah, I mean, me, whoa, whoa. oh, sorry. Let me jump in just a, a little bit. Um, I need to amend one thing Duncan said. The blue lines are not OpenC2 commands. Anything that ends in a box that is blank AP contains OpenC2 commands and responses. And that's the reason that the, the PAR says API and not AP. It. In your implementation, in mine, they're all open C2. Okay. Because um, from our point of view, the PAR is a database and we don't see a reason to wrap database commands in open C2 commands, but anyway. Um, and that's where we differ and we'll need to resolve over time yeah. because there are lots of different databases and I would prefer to have a vendor agnostic blue interface. Mm. Um, <laughs> With regard to the transfer specifications, as Duncan said, we have a point to point and we have a pub sub. Um, we had kind of hoped that McAfee would help out on creating an open DXL transfer specification, but that never happened for reasons that I think mostly relate to internal McAfee politics that I can't speak anything to. Um, from my perspective, looking at it a little bit as the editor of the two transfer specs we have, um, since open DXL supports both point to point what they call a service and pub sub, what they call an event method, methods of messaging. Conceptually, I think the open DXL transfer spec for open C2 would probably look a fair amount like uh, a merger across the HTTP and MQTT specs. 
but that's conceptual and the details aren't written down anywhere. So as Duncan said, what, you know, what we actually have for OpenDXL right now are, is a placeholder that says it would be nice to have an OpenDXL transfer spec. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, the, the McAfee folks, obviously with the whole Trellix, you know, the, the, the spin-off and then acquisition of FireEye and rebranding to Trellix, they've, had, they've been through the ringer over the past six to eight months or so. Um, but at MITRE Attack Con last week, um, I ran into uh, Kathy Trahan, um, who was our previous marketing contact there for uh, the OCA. And I, I chatted her up a bit and uh, she actually said that they, she's like, okay, let's get re-engaged. And she introduced me to an open DXL person there. So I have my fingers crossed a little bit optimistic. They're going to get more engaged again. Um, I, I'm going to reach out to her this week to try to get that moving. Okay. I know nothing about Trellix or anything between Maxi and FireEye because I don't really like to follow the industry I'm part of. So. Yeah, so um, <laughs> McAfee got bought by another company, so it's super complicated. So McAfee, the larger company, split into two, one focused on the consumer and then the other focused on enterprise. The one focused on the consumer got bought by somebody I can't even remember. And the one focused on the uh, enterprise got bought by a private equity firm. And then the private equity firm bought FireEye, which had also split into two companies. And they merged McAfee and FireEye together, and they now call it Trellix. And that all happened within 12 months. So you can imagine the employees <laughs> working there, um, how much chaos that's been. So it sounds like what happened is semantic played over again and then complicated further. It's yeah, it was yeah, except worse even. Or, yeah, or, or, or HP worse, or more chaos. Name, yeah. Name any of ten companies that have been doing the same thing. So it's the cybersecurity industry. And yeah. the auto industry. Stellantis, sure. who knows what that is. <laughs> no. So so Jason, back to the bigger picture then of um pace specific OCA work. If come June, I did want to make use cases that did somehow make use of information from stick shifter and orchestral. What do you use to talk to anything else? Yeah, so, so stick shifter is a library and a CLI that uses that library. So it's not talking quote unquote to anything. Um, I mean, you can make it talk to things, but that would be like another layer, like how are you going to use it, right? And in fact, the Tenzier guys in the past have hooked it to threat bus in that similar way. So they called the library from threat bus. Um, Kestrel is a library and runtime and Jupyter Notebook uh uh, I can't remember the name of the term. It's like a library shim or whatever API um, for Jupyter. Um, it and it has so it has what it's called enrichment modules and stuff that it can call out to. So it could have an enrichment module that called out to a messaging bus in theory, so that in a hunt you could maybe call out to the par. Um, but again, that would have to be something that would have to be built. It doesn't exist right now, right? But if if well i'm really big into what's Kestrel called hand could, waving light on that I, it's fine to have little boxes that don't exist yet and say hey here's what it looks like on one side of the box here's what it looks like on the other we'll just wave our hands for now in between the two and eventually someone will write the software that's exactly it right so it it could call out to any messaging fabric for like enrichment it just doesn't you know once someone wants to go in and build that it, it'll exist <laughs> It doesn't exist right now. So in all those architecture pictures that you made way back when and now Russ is making, there's no actual, there's just all these boxes with functions. They don't actually talk to each other. There is no, 
fabric that's tying all of these things together right now um, in open source. So the, the closest thing would be Tenzir's threat bus example that they did. So they well, have this thing. The closest thing is MQTT because because there's pictures seen on the screen. So I'll at least argue with, hey, let's just keep doing MQTT and talk everybody else into it. You could. So so what you could what what we could do, right, is um the Kestrel runtime could add a module for open C2 over MQTT and then it could talk into this. That would make sense. Um, that that would also, actually make a lot of sense. I mean, there's real use cases for that, I, I think. There, there's also, um, we do have another project, Duncan, um, coming. That I, So when I said we're trying to see what we can do with this use case, trying to see yeah. if we can bring this project into this use case, something that we built um, under the DARPA Chase project that recently got opened. Um, so. We're working What's that through. Say? What name is that project? Uh, it's a DARPA project called Chase that IBM participates in. Oh, so it's not a it's not an OCA project. Sorry, I'm not. Me. It's not. But we're trying to um, go through the mechanisms to open source what was done, okay. so that we can bring it to this interop plug fest thing. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into too many details until we've gone through. Right, you, you got to get through all IP. Yeah. But it does involve it does involve Open C two. Um, Good, so. we love it. Yeah, if we can do anything to help with that, and if you are successful in that, does it already have some other integration bus it would use, or would MQTT work for it too, or HTTP? Either of those good, or do you have something else in mind? Trying to remember what they used, and I. It might have been MQTT. I'd have to go and find it. I can't remember. I'll have to okay. find out what it's using under the hood. I'm pretty sure it is MQTT. Great. That's that's good news. Glad to hear it. If we can do anything to help, let us know. I think we're over time, by the way. Yeah, we're over time, and I have another meeting in like one minute. So I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>